The bandwidth, the bandwidth of our human visual system, if we haven't got any problems with our eyesight, is the same whatever the direction of the object is. So if we take the decomposition we just carried out, which can be done by the filtering interpretation of the wavelet transform, if we take that decomposition and ignore these parts, which are the very high frequencies, which we can ignore, as we said, because they contain information which may not be pertinent to the object we have in hand. Then we have a bandwidth of the signal, which is like this. It is a cruciform bandwidth. Cruciform means cross-like bandwidth. How many of you do you know what, what is P and what is NP? Okay, I can see some hands there, here. Okay. How about the Pittsburgh guy? Can you give us an answer from Pittsburgh? <laughs> okay. So, P is really a complexity class containing of all the problems that can be uh, solved easily. Okay, so what we mean easily here, we mean in polynomial time. Let's say uh, this is one of the impairments that we try to um, overcome. Uh, imagine that if we have uh, one signal with very high power and all the others with uh, smaller power, and you direct these signals to an optical uh, amplifier, then the one with the highest uh, power will experience uh, the largest uh, gain. Uh, so at the output, this one will be even more intense, and the others, uh, relatively to this one, will, be, uh, will have a smaller power. Okay, and if you pass through other uh, amplifiers, this will be uh, uh, intensified. So, um, after a while, the very strong signals will suffer from nonlinearities. Okay, the high power signals will suffer from nonlinearities, and the other signals probably uh, their power will be dropped to the level of uh, the noise, so you will not have a, a good detection. So, what's the story about transitive closure? You are given a directed graph, okay? And you know that you are going to be asking lots of queries of the form, is there a path between 3 and 17? Is there a path between 87 and, and 68? And so on, I mean, right? I mean, uh, and you want to compute a graph, uh, to compute a matrix that already has all the answers to all possible such queries. That's the transitive closure algorithm. So this is a compact way. Why is it compact? Because given that I am at a node, I very simply go through the various arcs that are, are outgoing, and usually to traverse or make a shortest path problem or a flow problem or whatever else, that's all I need to do. I do local calculations at each node and its outgoing arcs, and I only need to know these kinds of things, okay? So this is a very simple way to describe it, right? Okay, so let's, uh, let's continue on then. Uh, so the typical, of course, type of packet filtering is by address. This is probably familiar to most of you. Uh, simply looks at the, the source and destination addresses and says, is this something that we want to be happening or not? Uh, mainly used, uh, in particular, to prevent insertion of packets with forged source addresses. So oftentimes what you'll see is any rule set in any firewall starts off with something like this. And what it internally does is that, if we have saved that file successfully, that corresponds to a commit operation, in which case it basically deletes that log, so it does not need to basically do recovery when the application restarts, right? So built into Word, if you will, is some kind of a transaction semantics already, okay? It is not 100% pure, but enough of the semantics is there that it helps you a little bit, okay? So let me, I guess, uh, complete the lecture active replications, right? So what we covered was that, a single copy gets replicated into multiple copies, right? And as far as the client is concerned, 
they think that they're actually talking to a single copy, right? And there is this replication layer which is going to duplicate the requests to all the copies, right? And responses from those multiple copies are going to be combined in some way, and hopefully the client receives one response, right? And if one of those copies, uh, replicas actually dies, there's really very little difference because the whole process continues as usual. If you provide insight, explain why something is like that, and what exactly is going to happen, then we can give you partial credit. That's how it works. Does it answer your question? Uh, yes. Although, for the, I think that, okay, maybe we have some more time in the recitation on Monday to discuss the specific exercise and maybe ask sure, you, sure. Ask we you whether the specific solution that I came up with is equivalent, is uh, worth sure, the sure. same amount of points. What's the challenge here? How can you provide these things without increasing application complexity? We've already said that these things are complex enough. Suppose I want to add more properties to them, like reliability, real time, security. Won't I make these more complex? How can I add all these things without increasing the complexity? That's the challenge, okay? So my work looks at one illity. So I picked one, which was dependability. And I said, let me pick this in the context of applications, middleware applications, and let's see what we can do here. Whenever you've ended a process or a task, you've actually created a hole inside that ready queue because you've said you've taken something away. Again, go back and think about your bounded buffer problem. Producer, consumer, you take something out of the queue, you've created a space there. A producer can come in and put something in there. Would that be a good time to go off and wake up the dispatcher to say, now you can go and dump stuff into the queue? 